Every year at the end of October in the U.S., we're all dressing up as monsters and ghouls for Halloween. But in Mexico, families are gathering together for a celebration of the deceased loved ones. A holiday that they call Día de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead. Now, some of the costuming and skull iconography may look similar. But the comparison between these two holidays really stops there. To me, Day of the Dead seems more akin to our Thanksgiving, a time for families to get together and share some great food, all accompanied with beautiful memories and solemn reminders of departed loved ones. It's a holiday for appreciating the best things in life, both what we have and what has gone before. I spent the day with our family friend, Andres Mendes. He explained to me what the traditions around Day of the Dead mean to him. We started off really early in the morning at the main cemetery in Oaxaca City, the one that they call Panteón General, to get an idea of how the families were preparing for their evening festivities. One of the first things you notice this time of year, no matter where you are in Mexico, are the flowers, especially the cempasúchil, the marigolds. Throughout the countryside, the fields are just filled with that beautiful orange color. And everywhere you look, every flower display seems more spectacular than the last. You know, the care and detail that the families put into these graveside decorations is really remarkable. It seems to me that in the United States, oftentimes when we think about coming to a cemetery, we're thinking about sort of final. But here, people come and celebrate in the cemeteries because they're celebrating life and family life and kind of what's gone on before. That's and correct. What is all this? What are the niches? Tonight, they will actually be lighted. Okay. There will be a lot of candles uh -huh. on each niche. And um, it's also really interesting to come and look at them because you find a lot of famous Oaxacan people, oh, artists, do you really? uh, politicians that are buried here. Uh -huh. um, Macedonio Alcala is a very famous uh, musician. Uh -huh. um, He's got a street named after him, right? That's right, <laughs> yeah. This is really fascinating. There's a lot of activity starting on around here with uh, people coming to clean the graves up mm -hmm. and to, to uh, put the flowers out and everything. While most every home will have a private altar inside dedicated to their loved ones, here at the Pantheon, groups of people create enormous public displays, including exquisitely detailed sand paintings. It's kind of like a competition, right? Like competition yes. for people who can make the best sand paintings and altars. I see a whole lot of altars here. That's but right. Tell me a little bit about the significance of the sand paintings. Yeah. Tapetes de arena. Yeah, tapetes de arena. So for example, after a person passes away, uh -huh. they would make a sand um, tapete de arena yeah. um, with the saint that the person was devoted to. Oh, okay. And then okay. after nine days, nine. they will uh, pick it up. The public altars are equally impressive. They generally weave together all the traditional elements, but they display them on a grand scale. And here is a beautiful, beautiful altar. It's very, looks very traditional to me. It I don't is know very traditional. It does. Yeah, <laughs> you have the simpasuchi, uh, yes. the, uh -huh. the yellow flowers. Yes. Um, you put all the favorite food of the person that you are dedicating right. these altar to. And then of course there's the Day of the Dead bread, the, the bread. classic thing mm -hmm. that goes on every altar it seems yeah, to me. And, and now what about all the fruit? There's fruit, there's peanuts, there's pecans. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an offering to the beloved one, so you want to have the best that's available because these, they are in season right now. And mm -hmm. always lots and lots of ca uh, candles on the altar.
The activity continued outside as well, where all these street stalls were being set up in anticipation of the evening celebration. Andres and I decided it would be a good time to get a little bite to eat. Hola, buenas. buenas this little stall had all the classic Oaxacan street food, tostadas, empanadas, those little fried Oaxacan molotes. Uno de amarillo y un molote, por favor. I ordered the yellow mole empanada, which starts with a large, fresh made corn tortilla that they lay right on that comal over a wood fire. And then they fill it with yellow mole, a handful of cilantro, some shreds of chicken. They fold it up, toast it, and serve it steaming hot. Muchas gracias. Andres ordered the potato molote that's filled with chorizo and then topped with that smooth Oaxacan guacamole, some shredded cabbage, a little queso fresco. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Wow, is that beautiful. Um, my mouth is watering now so much that I can hardly talk. So let's just have something to eat. had invited me to cook and eat dinner with his family that night. So we went to the Central de Abastos market to get all the ingredients for the meal. We were going to be making the recipe for his grandmother's black mole. At the market, we began right where that recipe starts, with the dark dried chilies. Okay, so we are going to make the mole negro. And That's right. What, which, or you make it with chilhuacle negro? No, not with chilhuacle. Uh, I only use uh, ancho negro. Ancho negro. Yeah. Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. <laughs> este es el ancho... El mulato. El mulato. El mulato. mulato ancho sí. negro. Un kilo, por favor, señor. Pastilla. So you just make it from one chile. I know yes. some people put different Yeah, they have a, a mixture of chiles, but um, the recipe that... I've been using. Yes. Uh, Is just, it that's the one from your grandmother? That's that's right. Okay. Yeah. Bueno, hello. Ah, muy bien. Along with all those ingredients that we needed for the mola, we were also looking for some special items for an altar that we were building at the Mendez family home for Andres's mother, our good friend Tony, who died a few years ago. A staple Day of the Dead offering is the bread that's baked for this holiday. The market has aisles full of the sweet-tasting loaves that are decorated with colorful icons and sprinkled with sesame seeds. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Y con permiso. We picked out a few loaves and then moved on to another section of the market for some more traditional altar items. The copal incense, nuts, and a variety of candles. So which ones do you want to get? Sugar skulls are an iconic offering on the Day of the Dead altars. We picked out a couple of them and had them personalized, one with Tony's name and one with mine. It wouldn't be a properly decorated altar without a couple of calaveras, the skeleton figures. They come dressed in all sorts of attire, from bride and groom to bakers, mariachi players, barbers, just about anything you could imagine. No altar is complete without flowers, and Andres and I bought a big bunch of beautiful marigolds. Sugar cane is traditionally used to form an arch over the altar, and we picked up some before heading to the home of Andres' family to start cooking our mole. Okay, Andres, where do we start? I imagine it's with these chilies we bought in the market. <clears throat> That's right, so first we need to get them cleaned out. I like to use the scissors. Okay. It's very easy just to cut it like this, mm -hmm. and then you make another cut right here, and then you just get uh, all the seeds out, okay. and then the veins okay. here. We have a hot comal right here, yes. so we are gonna uh, roast it. And you can press on it, so it gets cooked more evenly. Okay. 
So we have some warm water here. So I'm just gonna put it in here. It doesn't have to boil, it's just to um, soak them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then the onion, if you could cut that in half, okay. and then in quarters, okay. so we can roast them. And now we are gonna roast the garlic. Just okay. throw them in there. Uh -huh. And also the, uh, the onion at the same time. Okay. You got the beautiful purple tomatillos yes. over here. And you want me to cut them in half? Yes. Okay, so the onion's ready now. It's soft, yes. kind of brown, little blackened in spots. You've got this beautiful golden pork lard there. The classic yes. Oaxacan pork lard. That's right. So I'm gonna start with the peanuts. Andres fried the peanuts until they were a toasty brown in color. Then we fried up all the rest of the ingredients. Almonds. Yes. Pecans. Oh, a couple more? Yep, just a couple. Raisins. Yes. Okay. Same amount? Same amount. Okay, one big handful. Bread. And Andres put in a good sized chunk of yes. day old bread to fry. Then the plantains that I had sliced up. And finally, the sesame seeds. About like that or a little more? A little bit more. Okay. Oh, and it starts popping. Good thing we're outside here. <laughs> so I think this is ready. Yeah, okay, here, wait. Get it out of there before we uh, lose it all. <laughs> then we moved on to sauteing the vegetables for the mole. The tomatillos and already roasted onions and garlic went in, along with a few chopped Roma tomatoes. Andre stirred the vegetable mixture until it broke down into kind of a chunky stew. Now that everything was toasted and fried and cooked down, we moved on to blending the three different mixtures that make up the mole. First into the blender with the nuts, the plantains, and the raisins, along with a little bit of water to catch the blade. That made a kind of saucy mixture that we fried down in a little pork fat in a cazuela. Andres had to stir that sauce nearly constantly to keep it from burning, while I moved on to the chili mixture. I added the softened, rehydrated chilies to the blender with a little bit of their soaking liquid, and then I blended that to a smooth puree. And there's the black of the black mole. That's right. The stewed vegetables went into the blender. And then that sauce was added to the mole along with some chicken broth, some Mexican oregano, avocado leaves that Andres had toasted over the fire. chunks of Mexican chocolate, and then a little seasoning of sugar and salt. So we'll just let that simmer away and we'll go see what they're doing at the altar. All right. All right. In the dining room, my wife Deanne and Tony's daughter Lani were finishing up the family altar. They had beautifully set up all the portraits and traditional offerings to honor Tony. continued to simmer, Andres and I made some little black bean tostadas to serve as an appetizer. I blended up some cooked black beans with toasted avocado leaf and then cooked that mixture down in a cazuela. While the beans were cooking, we worked on a simple salsa that's made from toasted and soaked Oaxacan pasilla chili, some roasted tomatillos, and roasted garlic. We made some simple guacamole, too, for the tostadas, and then topped the whole thing off with some really beautiful queso fresco. So um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. I hope you enjoy the food that we have prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Those are delicious.
I could eat those every day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go break the mole for them, right? Let's yeah, go. I'm ready for it. That's yes. <laughs> First taste of the mole. The dead bread that's a fixture on most altars around Oaxaca City is traditionally made as a large loaf that's sprinkled with sesame seeds and finished with that brightly colored face that's inserted in the top. I've been told it's a sort of representation of the spirit leaving the body. In other parts of Oaxaca and in Puebla and Mexico City, the bread is sprinkled with sugar and it's topped with a crossbone shape that's made out of the same dough. And in Chicago, when we put up our own altar each year in our restaurants Frontera Grill and Topolo Bampo, that's the style of bread that we make for the occasion. The Day of the Dead bread is based on pan de yema, egg yolk bread, which is closely related to hala and brioche. So I'm going to show you how to make a really delicious version of that that's straightforward. It's a very buttery recipe. And the first thing that we have to do, actually, is to beat some butter. I'm gonna unwrap two sticks, cut those up. Put the butter into the mixer and beat it until it's completely smooth. that off and set it to the side and now we're going to proof some yeast. We've got a package of dry yeast here but I want to absolutely make sure that it is active. So I'm going to put it into a mixing bowl along with just a little bit of sugar. That'll help it to foam up right away if it's very active. And now I'm gonna add lukewarm water, about 110 degrees, about a quarter of a cup. It's smelling very yeasty and it's nicely foamy. So I'm gonna add the other ingredients to it. We have a tablespoon of sour cream that goes in. four eggs. And flour. You may wonder why my flour is in a dish like this. It's because I want everything for this recipe to be cold when it goes together. So I've got a pound of flour, about three and a half cups of flour, all together cold. that onto the mixer and I'm going to use the dough hook of my stand mixer to do the kneading of this recipe for me. Okay, the dough is elastic now. That took about four or five minutes of kneading with the machine and I'm going to incorporate all of the butter. Now this is the reason everything was cold to start with. I don't want a warm dough that this butter is going into because the butter would just melt right out of it. So this is a rich dough. So I'm going to little by little add the butter to it, waiting until each addition is incorporated before adding the next. What makes this recipe so delicious, besides all that butter I just put in it, is the long, slow rise. So I'm going to scrape this into a bowl, put it into the refrigerator, covered, and let it rise for at least eight hours. It's actually best if you let it go for 12, 15, even 24 hours. So the dough is ready now, and I'm going to show you how to form that classic pan de muerto 
style bun, but, but smaller so that they're more like individual little buns. So out that comes. I'm going to flour it just a little bit. And I want this to be as even as possible because I'm going to cut it into 12 pieces. Now, for each one of these little buns, I'm going to need that little crossbones piece. So I'm going to cut a piece off of each one to use to form that with. It'll be about a quarter of the size. Then I'm going to take a little square of dough and I'm rolling it under my palm and form a nice little ball. This is lined with a silicone baking mat. I would recommend using that or a piece of parchment on the bottom here. To form the crossbones, I'm going to roll this out, cut it in half, and then roll each piece using three fingers to make three indentions. I want the center one to be the deepest indention. I'm going to lay one piece of it. It should come down and cover it all the way to the bottom there. And then the other one goes right across it. I let these little panes de muerto rise in a warm part of the kitchen for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours, till they were clearly double in bulk. Beat an egg with a little bit of water, beat it really well, and I'm going to use it as a glaze over the exterior of all of these. After you've glazed a row of the panes, sprinkle on a little bit of coarse sugar. This will make them look really great. It's about 15 minutes in a 350 degree oven and these will be beautifully done. After we had had dinner with the Mendes family, Deanne and I went to another cemetery that evening in the town of Hoho. Every year they make this special display of those amazing sand paintings. The whole area was packed with people, all celebrating the holiday with a spirit of togetherness. The cemetery at Hoho also has some of the most beautiful and moving candlelit displays that I've ever seen in my life. We felt so privileged to be able to experience this remarkable place on this day, when the souls of those who have gone before us are welcome back to celebrate in the vibrant world of the living.